Yes! Welcome back, those of you who came back. Um, Moav and I will be watching how attendance develops throughout the semester, and of course there's an underlying competition between the two of us. So two weeks from now, Mohav will take over, and I'll try to keep as many of you engaged until then, and then many of more, many more will come back probably, and um, we'll take the tally afterwards then. Um, we're not asking you to take sides, of course. Um, so this is the second lecture in in 4820. Um, today we'll mostly introduce the implementation language that we'll need to use for this semester. And um, before we do that, I was going to just point out to you that there's a lot of information on this. So when we say the course page or the semester page, we assume that's obvious to most of you, certainly those who have been students at the University of Oslo before. But um, surely some of you actually, this is your first semester here. So that's the page we assume you follow closely. Um, I like to say half jokingly when you get up in the morning, the first thing you do is of course fix yourself a cup of coffee and then maybe look at our course page. And so here is the outline of lectures and suggestions for readings. And in the first few weeks, we've been very generous with our suggestions for readings. Um, this is mostly a Lisp background from the Seibel book. Fairly easy reading. You can have a Lisp interpreter on the side. It's, it's playful. And then starting here, we'll actually start to talk about machine learning. Um, and we do assume that when you come to the lecture, um, or that by the time we hold the lecture, whether you come or not, that you have read what we have recommended you read. So um, the purpose, the point of the lecture is not to go through these materials. Um, it's to reflect on these materials and jointly try to obtain a deeper understanding. So please make it a habit to look at these readings and um, make sure you have absorbed what we wanted you to absorb before the lecture. And if one week you didn't manage to do the reading, it's still better to come to the lecture than not to come, of course. Um, so that's one thing I just wanted to point out to you. There's more information here, and we keep adding to it. There's, of course, the messages. Um, we have now scheduled, um, published a schedule for the publication and submission deadlines for our five um, problem sets, three obligatory assignments, the second and the third split into two parts. If you weren't here last week, here's again the, the scheme, the rationale that we use for um, what we require you to do to qualify for the final exam. Even the date and place, I think, of the final exam is known by now. So please make it a habit, follow this page. Um, there's also the discussion board, Piazza, I'm probably not logged in here on this machine. Um, and I don't want to use time now to log in. Um, but that's another communication channel that we hope will be used actively. All right. Um, any questions at this point about the logistics, the organization, the mechanics of the course? How we communicate with you, how you find the information you will need. Then let's dive into today's lecture. So um, what we'll usually do is use five to ten minutes in the beginning of each lecture looking back. Now I feel last week's lecture was relatively, uh, let's say, high level. Some might say light in content, so I'll, I have a single slide looking back. But uh, down the road, we'll maybe have two or three, but this shouldn't be too much of each lecture, but it, it serves to make sure that you have some idea of what we think was um, the most important take-home message from the preceding week. So uh, a big part of last week's lecture was to give you some sense of what we mean by artificial intelligence or what others might mean by artificial intelligence. And the take-home message really is um, it's ill-defined. Um, it's a term that has been around since the mid-1950s. Um, there have been applications of 
increasing complexity, you might say, ranging from trivial chatbots, mathematical theory improving, moving around blocks in a tiny three-dimensional world, but giving commands to a robot arm um, in natural language, expert systems, dialogue systems, um, early game playing, checkers, later chess. Um, and I think it's fair to observe, at least that's the claim we made last week, that it's a moving target. Whatever seems kind of out of reach just now and is complicated, um, we'll be tempted to, to call um, intelligent or artificial intelligence. So more recent applications, I gave you some examples, include what is now often, often called the conversational user interface, QE talking to your cell phone rather than interacting with it um, um, or talking to your computer, giving commands in, in natural language. Um, uh, Self-driving cars, obviously, uh, a very visible application currently. That's about to happen, I think, in certainly in our lifetimes. Um, uh, talking robots, uh, the breakthrough in beating the top-ranked professional Go player earlier this year. Um, all of these demonstrate software systems, computers that appear to um, solve complex problems that we are tempted to call, to assume require some, some notion of intelligence. Um, but there are also notions of business intelligence. The example I gave last week, uh, companies trying to monitor how their products are generally perceived, um, the wisdom of the masses, um, sentiment analysis, all sorts of data analytics, big data analytics, all sorts of machine learning um, are now increasingly dubbed artificial intelligence. So the term is very much in fashion again. And I think it remains true that um, whatever seems really difficult, impressive, and a little bit surprising that we can do it, um, we are currently tempted, or people are currently tempted to consider artificial intelligence. Um, so we suggested as the um, sort of running away from, from this difficult question of definition, um, we'll look at artificial intelligence just like many people do currently as, as a bag of tricks, uh, a toolkit, uh, methods for representation and, and, and problem solving. And we will introduce a sequence of such methods and we will pick consistently problems involving natural language because that's what our own research is about. So that was my looking back. That was at least five minutes. Now let's move on. Topic of the day is not artificial intelligence, but it's a programming language. Um, we'll introduce you to a programming language we assume few of you have used before, Common Lisp. And you might ask, couldn't we do this in Python? Yes, we could, but um, it wouldn't be nearly as much fun. Um, so. One argument often given is that learning Lisp will make you a better person. Um, so Eric Raymond, um, um, I guess, gives you an expectation here. So you'll have the profound enlightenment experience in a couple of weeks, maybe already today, um, when you finally get it. And that experience will make you a better programmer for the rest of your days, even if you ever actually never, never end up using Lisp um, a lot. But you might well, um, because Lisp is a bit like AI sort of going in cycles, in fashion, out of fashion, making comebacks. Um, we'll just assert, characterize it as a high-level language that is nevertheless efficient. It compiles into their very mature compilers into machine code. Um, and it has especially strong support for symbolic programming, that is problem solving that involves symbolic, non-numeric data, and for functional programming. Uh, it's very rich, it's always had or it has long had a multitude of built-in data types and operations, uh, a comprehensive standard library, and that used to be held against it. It was considered an inflated, a bloated language. But the tendency is, of course, that we now expect all of these. We, <laughs> nobody expects to do the, 
their own implementation of a hash table any longer. Um, it's an excellent programming uh, teaching language, teaching teaching programming language for our purposes because the syntax is extremely simple. It couldn't be more simple than um, than what it is. And so is the semantics, understanding how Lisp programs actually work. Um, it's fully standardized, stable, and there are several mature development environments, many of them available in uh, open source, under open source licenses. And we'll try to give you a sense of its suitability for what is often considered incremental, agile, interactive development. As I said last week in passing, another benefit of picking Lisp is that you all start at pretty much the same level. And we think that's uh, actually an, an advantage in going into this class. A um, little bit of history, we looked at most of this last week already. Lisp was conceived as a mathematical formalism, um, uh, a way of characterizing computing um, as an alternative to the Turing machine, the notion of the Turing machine by John McCarthy who also was one of the founding fathers of AI, so the connection is at least historically clear and strong. Um, and Lisp nowadays names a family of high-level languages, so there are Lisp dialects, including Scheme, which we use here in Bachelor teaching, um, Introduction to Functional Programming, um, Emacs Lisp, the language that was adopted for customization and extension of the editor that we recommend to you. Um, Common Lisp, the kind of industrial standard, the one that has, has been standardized by an ANSI committee. Clojure, a more recent offspring, um, has a variant Clojure script, and that is actually what is currently gaining traction in the sort of non-academic world as a, a, a fashionable, more and more widely used Lisp dialect, um, and they all share most of the all of the the traits I had on the preceding slides: um, simple syntax, straightforward semantics, um, rich symbolic programming, functional programming. Um, it's a multi-paradigm language in the sense that you're not bound to do to to think purely functional, and we will think somewhat functional. But we won't be purists about that, um, much less so than we are in the in the bachelor course, um, Introduction to Functional Programming. And um, throughout the semester, we might at times reflect on the choices. So we will make use of destructive operations on mutable data structures a lot, actually. And we'll argue that that is a prerequisite to some of the problems that we'll jointly solve. And um, so now, extremely syntax, um, we'll introduce it by example. Um, we hope you've been to the laboratory session this week already, on Monday, have played with the REPL, the read, eval, print loop, also something that Lisp introduced that has become relatively standard fare nowadays. You type an expression into the interpreter, it's evaluated, and the return result you can inspect immediately. Um, no save, compile, run cycle required. Uh, you turn around um, uh, playfully uh, expressions in the language much, much faster. So interactive, um, an interactive development environment. By convention, we'll often use the question mark to represent the prompt. Uh, so that's not something you type into the Lisp system and the arrow um, to show what comes back. The result of evaluating a, an expression, the, the value that is computed. Um, so atomic data types, numbers, uh, booleans, strings, evaluate to themselves. I type them in, what comes back is the same thing, the same literal. Um, T means uh, is, is the boolean truth value, and nil is the boolean false value. Um, though nil actually, we'll see, has a, a dual life. So I type these in, they come come back as themselves. They are self-evaluating. Then there's symbols, and they evaluate to whatever value they're bound to. So they function much like variables. I type in pi, that's a predefined constant, and what comes back is the value associated to pi. I type in foo, that's not a predefined um, uh, 
variable and it has no value and so the Lisp system will not return anything but it will rather throw an error. It will say there is no associated value for the symbol foo. I can't evaluate it. Um, let's introduce a little bit of terminology. Um, the expressions, the forms, the pieces of Lisp code um, are called symbolic expressions or S expressions or S uh, exps. I don't even know how to pronounce that. I'm pretty sure it's not sex piece, but I actually know how that, that is pronounced. <laughs> as expressions. Um, it's what I would usually say. And we, they're, they're, they're subdivided into two fundamental types. The atoms, the things we have seen so far, that don't... Um, 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 going to say that don't have internal structure, but you might say a string does have internal structure. So these types are what we call atoms, and they contrast with the lists. Um, uh, and lists are the basic mechanism to build compound expressions, that is expressions that contain other expressions. And the elements can obviously be either atoms or lists again. So lists are defined as a data type recursively. And the uh, a property will stress several times. Um, Lisp uses the same collection of data types to represent actual data and its code. So a Lisp program is just represented in terms of S expressions, as would be the data that the program pro processes. Um, let's look at some code. S start by calling simple functions. So add 1 and 2, um, confirm that the Lisp interpreter actually gives the right result. Um, what we see here is what is called parenthesized prefix notation. So the first element, so a, a function call is a list, has a pair of parentheses. And the first element in the list is the operator. It names a procedure or a function. The remaining elements are the operands, the arguments to the function. Um, we can nest lists, so here we have another example where we see that um, this notation quite naturally extends to functions with variable arity. So plus can take anywhere between zero and any number of arguments. And that doesn't cause me any hardship in terms of writing that down in terms of the syntax because I put the operator in the prefix in the first position and then anything that follows will be the arguments. Um, here we have an example of what I was going to introduce. Nesting of lists uh, corresponds to a compound expression. So here I have the sum of 10 and 20 divided by 2 and I just put one piece of Lisp code and as expression that calls the function plus on 10 and 20 into an operand position in another one. And um, what determines how things hang together is the, the, the parenthesis. And I can spread that out over multiple lines. I can insert white space as I please to make it readable. And um, Emacs will have um, indentation rules built in, so you press the tabulator key and it make it it will make it uh, readable. So this is the classic way of spreading out uh, 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 an expression that is so complex that it doesn't fit onto a single line and indenting um, to show that this list down here um, is an element of this top level list up here. Um, yes. How many elements are in this top level list here? Two. And they are? Who said two? What are they? The first and the second. And that's the first? E did I say how many arguments or how many elements? So you're saying there are two operands. <laughs> the first, this one, and the second. 
And then there is also the operator. So that makes three elements. Um, it's possible I misled you in asking the question. But, uh, so if we just count the number of elements in this list, the one that corresponds to the outermost pair of parentheses, then this is one, and the next one is a list. But this whole S expression is one element in the top level list, and then there is one more. So there are three at the top level, but some of them are uh, lists themselves, and um, hence how many elements are in this list here, the minus? That's three again, because the first element counts. Well, the first element is a list. Sorry, the second element is a list. The first element is the operator. The first operand, which is the second element, is a list. And then the third element, which is the second operand, is a number. All right, so these are some basic reflections on Lisp expressions and data types. Um, so that's the syntax. Um, what remains to be introduced is the semantics. And by semantics, um, here we mean the rules of computation. So Lisp lists are code. They are expressions that can be executed. And the semantics of any expression is defined in terms of the value that is computed for it. And that's what we call evaluation. It's evaluated. And for any expression, um, there will be a value that is the result of executing, of computing that expression. So the exponentiation of 8 minus 4, 4 um, square, returns as the value of that expression 16. So that's the semantics of Lisp. We determine the value of the expression, and um, that's all you need to know about the syntax and the semantics. Really very simple, isn't it? Um, this we've said already. Uh, first element of a list. Lists are function calls. First, na first element names a function. It's invoked with the values of all remaining elements as its argument. That's a, an important um, uh, making things more precise. So we have a list. It contains three elements. And the second element is, again, a list. We want to exponentiate. So what are going to be the values to the exponentiation? First, I need to determine the value of this piece of code, the um, embedded list, which also corresponds to a function call. So I evaluate this one. It evaluates to 4. I also evaluate this one. The 2 is self-evaluating. It evaluates to 2. Once I have done that, that is, I have evaluated all of the arguments, now I can invoke the function and compute the resulting value. <laughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, so the semantics defined in terms of evaluation. First, evaluate all of the arguments, then invoke the function and return the uh, value that it's compute it computes, and that will be the semantics of the expression at large. That's the basic order of business. Um, we will introduce a few exceptions to this um, rule of evaluation and we'll call these special forms and each will have its own evaluation rules. And um, today already we'll learn a few of the special forms. So standard evaluation strategy, evaluate all of the arguments recursively if you have to, then invoke the function. And here's our first special form. How do we define a function? And this is the syntax, um, a list containing as its first element the symbol defun, then a function name, a list containing parameter names, and any sequence of S expressions that will be the body of the function. This is something that we type into the Lisp interpreter, not to immediately compute something, but to actually have the side effect of associating a function definition with this name. So 
This is an S expression that we actually don't want to evaluate according to the standard rules. Can someone say why not? What would happen if we... So I have... Oh, that's going to be annoying. I have a Lisp interpreter. So we type in a function definition, which you surely recognize. We'll come back to that soon enough. Um, if this were evaluated according to the rules I just gave you, what would happen? Yes? You were you were you you were about to say it will throw an error because something is not defined. So what would happen is that before the function that we assume the first element names can be invoked, all of the arguments have to be evaluated. So the first argument is a symbol. Symbols evaluate to the value that is associated with them. Well, that's what we want it to be, but currently we're pretending that Lisp will evaluate this according to the rules that I just taught you, and we're finding out why that would not be a good idea. So if, if the rules of the standard rules of evaluation were applied to defun to this list, then the first thing that would happen is that the exclamation point, which is a symbol, it's just a regular identifier, would be evaluated. Also the list containing n would be evaluated. A list is a list is a function call. So to evaluate this list, it would evaluate all of the arguments, there are none, and then it would search for a function by the name n. Presumably neither the exclamation point nor the symbol n have a value binding currently. So um, there would be um, numerous sources for error if this definition were evaluated using the standard rules of evaluation. And it's not what we want anyway. We want Lisp to make a note of this function definition. We don't want it to compute a value when we give it a, a defun expression. And hence, defun is the first special form, and it has its own rules of evaluation, and it actually doesn't evaluate any of its arguments. It takes the first symbol as is and says, okay, you will be the function name. It takes the second argument, the Lisp, the list as is, and says, okay, any element in this list better be a symbol that name a parameter to this function that tells me how many arguments this function can take. And it takes the S expression here, doesn't evaluate it, but maybe compiles it, certainly associates it as the function definition with this name. So defun is a special form that has its own rules of evaluation. It doesn't evaluate any of its arguments. Um, here's an example. Uh, corresponds to so computing the average of two things, x and y. I can add x and y and then divide by two. Trivial. And that actually gives the right result. I type it into the REPL. Um, that means the function definition is established and I can immediately use it. That's what we hope you have experienced already playing with the Lisp system and the Seibel book. Um, so, each culture, each programming language has its icons, its hello world for functional programming. That's arguably the factorial function as a classic example. We already looked at it last week. It's a recursive, recursively defined mathematical function. Um, and that translates um, into Lisp pretty much one-to-one. -one. There's the function name here. There's the definition of the function that kind of corresponds to the defun. There is the parameter name, that's the n here. And then there is a, a, a case statement, depending on whether n equals zero or is greater than zero. And that's what we see down here in the if. 
and then there are computations associated with the case that this test actually returns true. That's the first line here. That's the then clause to the if. Or the case that n does not equal no 0, that this test returns false, and then this else clause down here will be evaluated. And this definition may seem circular if this is your first encounter with recursive functions. Um, we surely hope it is not. Um, and um, this is a, a valid mode of computation because um, the recursion in each instance reduces the problem and there is a non-recursive base case where the recursion terminates. So the reduction we observe here um, when we call factorial in computing a factorial we call it on a smaller number. We work towards zero and the base case we see here this is not recursive we just return one as the value when n is zero. So there the recursion terminates. Just for comparison here is a non-recursive implementation in Python in this case and um, we can compute the same function of course um, in um, uh, a loop, um, an iterative sequence of assignments. But um, some of us at least will feel that the correspondence between the Lisp recursive implementation and the mathematical definition is much more direct and obvious. And so in that respect this is um, the hello world of functional programming. Many problems have natural recursive definitions and writing recursive code um, often is a very good way of implementing solutions to these problems. That's all we're trying to reinforce here. We assume you know recursion. You've used it yourselves. Traversing a graph is a problem that is typically very natural to do in recursive functions. Because you go from one node to another and at each node you have the same set of choices to consider. Um, all right. Um, There's a special case of recursion. How many of you have heard about tail recursion? Know the distinction between? Hands up. Don't be shy. Many, but not everyone. <laughs> um, so, um, recursion has a bad reputation for being inefficient. And that is partly deserved. There is something that is potentially inefficient about recursion. And Intuitively, what that is, is that in computing this function, there is a recursive call to the factorial here. You can read this by now, can't you? I mean, you see that this list here is a function call that calls the function named by the symbol exclamation point. I'm trying to talk very precisely here. So, this is the recursive call. And once we're done computing the factorial of n minus 1. There's still one operation pending. There's still more work to do. We need to multiply with n to give the actual result. So, in this respect, the calling function needs to wait for the, re for the recursive call to terminate, to come back with the value, compute the additional multiplication. Only then can it return the actual value. This definition is not what we call tail recursive. A tail recursive function is one where the recursive call um, Oh no, I'm out of battery. Almost out of battery. A uh, tail recursive function is one where the recursive call um, um, is the last instruction of computation in the body of the function. So let's look at what we have done here. We have rewritten the factorial function. Here we have the same interface. It takes one parameter that we call n. We have rewritten it in terms of a helper procedure. An bang aux function, we call it. 
And that actually takes three arguments. One that is result, one that is an um, running counter i, and one that is the n that we actually want to compute. This is, this is a very common technique. Many of you will recognize it. And bang aux now for whatever n is called with a result of 1, um, an index 1, and the original n. And it will compute upwards and multiply with increasing i's towards n. And it will pass itself on each recursive call the current product in R. That's the, the result called the accumulator. So we work towards the result and we pass intermediate steps towards that result around as this first parameter, parameter R. So it's a recursive function. It needs a base case. It says, is I the counter, the index, greater than N? Then we better stop and return the result R. Um, unless, while that is not the case, it's recursive, it calls itself, it multiplies the R it was given with the current I and increments I by one. So it um, does one product and calls itself with I plus one, it moves one step closer to N. N never changes here. I would like to think that most of you see how this works. We'll very soon see a calling example. This is a, an idiomatic way of converting a recursive function into a tail recursive function. The key difference is that the recursive call here is no longer the argument of another computation. That means when um, that means the return value of bang aux will be whatever comes back from the recursive call without any additional operations applied to it. Now you might say, you might say, I kind of see what you're thinking, but it doesn't seem to be the case because the recursive call here is inside of another S expression. It's the else clause in an if statement. How is that not a pending computation? Any thoughts about that question? Yes? So if does not wait for the results of its arguments, you say. In fact, if we can now observe, and we can actually infer that from things I've said so far, if cannot be a regular function. Because if it were a regular function, what would it do? It would evaluate all of its arguments, in fact, Lisp would evaluate all of its arguments before the if actually would be evaluated. That's the standard rule of evaluation. Evaluate the arguments, then invoke the function. If, obviously, we don't want to evaluate all the arguments. We want to first evaluate the first argument, the test, and depending on the outcome of that, we want to give if the control of either e evaluating the second, the then clause, or the third argument, the else clause. So if is a special form. It's got to be a special form, because otherwise it couldn't do its job. So our second special form found in passing. Um, and um, because of that, we now know that if actually evaluates test first, when it's done with that, it evaluates one of the two clauses, then or else. And that means that as these clauses are evaluated and come back with a value, there's no more pending computation indeed. If there were any standard function wrapped around this recursive call, as there was in this example, multiplication surely is a standard function. Most of the functions are standard functions. There are a few special forms. We'll see many today. That's 
the nature of introducing the language to, to you. We've seen two already. And if there were any regular function wrapped around the recursive call, then it would not be a tail recursive function. So the point here is to move the recursive call out of the scope of another function around it so that whenever the recursive call returns, that is immediately the return value of the, uh, of the caller to the recursive call. So, um, <coughs> all right, that's color coding of what I've said already. So in this definition, the recursive call is in what we call the tail position. There's no ordinary function wrapped around it. And that means no work remains to be done in the calling function when this comes back. And once we reach the base case, the return value is immediately ready. And this is a configuration that common list compilers will recognize and they'll apply what is called tail call optimization. And um, that actually converts internally the recursive um, code into an iterative process. We can observe that. Um, there are also, side remark here, constructs. We're not purists. Um, um, in common lisp to write down iterative um, sequences. But we can observe the difference between non-tail recursive, standard recursive, and tail recursive in um, this uh, kind of visual display of the nested recursive calls here. So lisp has what is called a tracer. So we can ask it to print out every time a function is called, what the arguments to the function are, every time a function returns, what it returns. That's effectively what we're seeing here. So we see that the standard recursive definition of the factorial um, gives rise to increasingly deeply nested recursive calls. And in each case, I have a recursive call here until I eventually hit the base case. And it's wrapped around pending computation. There's more work waiting to be done. I hit the base case, so factorial of 1 actually returns 1. Now I can evaluate this expression. Three, it evaluates to uh, 2. I can evaluate this one. And I can now sort of come back from the nesting of recursive calls. Here, on the other hand, um, there's no such nesting, and instead, the increasing values I can observe here in what is the first argument, the accumulator, the parameter called r, to the tail recursive variant. So, initialize with 1, 1, and the actual n, then I count 1 upwards towards n, and for each step, I multiply with the current i. I multiply i and r. I accumulate the product. And once I actually, once I've, I've run past n, that means I have multiplied with n. So the last step was multiplying 720 with 7. Then I hit the base case and return the result straight away. And visually, it should already be clear that this code will execute more efficiently than this code. So recursion is conceptually often very nice, often a very good fit for specific types of problems. And it can be worth our effort to consider um, rewriting recursive functions into tail recursive versions. That won't always be possible. And non-tail recursive functions may also have merit. On that note, let's take a break here and come back at the quarter past. Okay, let's, let's continue. If I could have your attention, please. Um, there was one question in the break that made me wonder whether for those who see this idiom for the first time, it's worth commenting on a few more of its properties. What I'm doing here is I define two functions. One is called bang. That's just a symbol. Um, 
I haven't told you exactly which characters I can use in symbols, but it's pretty much everything that doesn't have special meaning. And so far we have seen the parentheses and the double quotes for strings. And we'll see two more today. So any other characters, including bang or the asterisk or the plus, which we usually don't think of as identifiers, um, they are just like foo and bar. They're valid names. And the identifiers in Lisp we call symbols. So bang is a symbol and bang minus aux is another symbol. I could have called this foo and bar or x and y. <laughs> These are just names. I define two functions here and I define both of them at the top level so they are both equally accessible to the user the way things stand. But one of them I intend as a helper function. And so I adopt a naming convention, minus aux, it just means I'm an auxiliary function to the function called bang. I'm a helper function. Um, of course, we don't intend anyone to call bang aux directly. It's only called through bang here and by itself. And there are mechanisms to hide it, make it inaccessible to users, but we're not dwelling on that here. Um, then here in the body we have the if, a test, and then here we have the then clause which is an expression. And what the R here is, is just a symbol. And that's evaluated. So that means whatever is the current value of the parameter named R will be returned. When they're opening parentheses, that's a function call. So there we see the difference between complex um, code and atomic code. A symbol evaluates to itself. Um, a number evaluates to itself. All right, so with these reflections, we need to move on. Um, we've kind of observed that the tail recursive definition um, gives rise to uh, less internal computational complexity and um, when compiled using a compiler that applies that bit of magic tail call optimization this will actually execute as if it were an iterative function definition so no overhead associated with to the to the recursion um, in this variant but here the overhead associated with recursive nesting of function calls inevitable. All right, let's move on. We have a few more language constructs we just need to throw in because you need them in for the current assignment. So, and we said that we use the same um, set of things as expressions um, to represent data and code. Currently we've looked at code, at functions, um, when we actually want to use an S expression as data to represent, so a symbol not as a variable, but just to represent something symbolic, then there is a, an operator that is a special form that suppresses evaluation. And it's fittingly the quote operator. Um, so we've seen that I type in pi, it evaluates to its value. When I make pi the argument in a what looks like a function call with quote as the operator what comes back is the symbol pi not its value and I can actually write that much more concisely as quote pi so that's a way of using symbols to represent data I don't have to use strings for that purpose which would evaluate to themselves I can use symbols and the quote operator to suppress evaluation. So this pi here now is um, a symbol that names something. I talk about the symbol, not about its value. Um, typing in a symbol that doesn't have a value, we've observed, gives an error. Quoting that symbol makes the symbol evaluate to itself, that is 
it comes back as a symbol. Um, here I just have a, a complex statement that uses pi as one of its arguments. When I quote that whole expression, nothing is evaluated, quote suppresses evaluation. So here I'm using a list to represent data. This is a list to represent code, a function call. This is a list to represent a collection of three, three things, two symbols and one number. So if I ever find the need to represent the collection of the symbols, asterisks, the star, and pi jointly with the number 2, I can do it this way. I can quote the list. And what happens if I evaluate an empty list? No operand? That's an error. Because I need to at least have an operand. I can have zero arguments. But I can quote that, and this would be the way to use the empty list to talk about an empty collection, again, as a piece of data. So the quote operator effectively gives me the distinction between using as expressions as code, unquoted, then they are evaluated, they are executed, or quoting them, suppressing evaluation, using them as data to represent whatever I I find convenient to represent using symbols or lists or um, other expressions. Um, so that wraps up this duality as expressions, uniform syntax to represent code and data. Um, and this, I think, is repeating what I just said. Mm, lists have a double role, like other ex as expressions. They're function calls when evaluated, unquoted, but they can also be data. They can be the symbolic representation of a sequence of things. For example, here the sequence of the symbols foo and bar. And now we'll introduce a few more list operations. So here, for example, I can write down the collection as a quoted list and it evaluates to itself the list containing foo and bar. Or I can use a function called list that takes any number of arguments, evaluates them, and collects them, returns a list containing those values. So if I want the symbols foo and bar in the list rather than their values, I need to quote foo and bar, give that these two arguments to the list function, and it will build me a list containing those two as data. So let's talk more about lists. Uh, one built-in data type. Um, at a time when in most other programming languages you were implementing your own list data type using pointers and linked lists. Um, and that actually contributed to the name of the language, so Lisp for list processing. It has lists essentially a notion of a sequence built in with many predefined operations and compilers tend to have very good support for efficient list operations. Um, the three basic functions to define the list data type are cons, the constructor, and first and rest, the destructors that respectively take out the first element or everything but the first element. So cons takes two arguments um, of which the second is a list and here I can use nil to represent the empty list and when I cons these three things together then that gives me a list containing the numbers one, two and three. Um, when I now take a list containing 1, 2, and 3, I quote it to suppress evaluation and cons it together with 0, I get a new list where the 0 is inserted as the new first element. So cons adds its first argument as the new first element to its second argument, and the second argument must be a list, which can be the empty list, which we can write as nil. Um, First takes out the first element of a list, rest returns everything but the first element. So effectively first and rest correspond to the first and second argument of cons. I can of course nest these arbitrarily deep and this will give me the first of rest is 
two. Someone was <laughs> showing two. Um, don't be shy. So this is evaluated um, essentially from the inside out. Um, first, before it can do anything, needs to evaluate its argument. So the rest, this innermost list is evaluated. Before rest actually gets to do any work, its argument needs to be evaluated, but it's quoted. So evaluation is suppressed. That means rest sees the list containing one, two, and three, and it takes out the first element. So it returns, as we have seen here, a list containing two and three, and then the first of that is two. So that's the kind of reasoning we apply here. The rest of the rest of the rest will give me... You have a question, all right. <laughs> So first and rest are the equivalent of car and cooter in scheme, yes. In fact, you can write car and cooter in Lisp too, but we kind of teach using the more modern names first and rest before, because we find them more easier to remember. So car, historic contents of address register, cooter, contents of decrement register. <laughs> first and rest are a lot easier to, uh, to, to remember, I find. Um, but you can actually use car and cooter, and that's first and rest. So, um, taking out the first element and returning what remains three times when there are three elements, what comes back is the empty list, which is canonically printed as nil. There are many additional list operations which I can derive from the above, so cons, first and rest are really the, the basics. Um, for example, we've seen it already, list a function that takes any number of arguments and returns a list with those arguments. Append that takes any number of lists and concatenates their elements. Length takes one list and returns the number, the count of elements. Reverse takes a list, returns the um, inverse sequence. Uh, nth a generalization of first and rest, will take out the element at the nth position counting from zero. So nth2 gives us the three position, the third position, because the first position is at index zero. So nth0 would be the equivalent of which function? First. Um, could I, well we don't really have time to play too much today, um, so what would happen if I give it plus as the first argument of cons here? Um, you probably know some scheme, yeah? Good, and that will help in this case. Um, Knowing scheme is great, but um, there's one important difference between scheme and Lisp, and we'll comment then on it towards the end of the lecture. So if I would say cons plus quote one, two, three, uh, I didn't say it explicitly, but because I did not say that cons is a special form, it's a function. All of these are functions. So when there are special forms, I will flag those, I'll wave a red flag. So. These are regular functions, that means all of their arguments are evaluated before the function actually is invoked. So, cons plus, that's a symbol, it's evaluated, what happens? I'm asking for the associated value, and now the question is, what's the associated value of the symbol plus? We know there is a function by that name, but that's not necessarily the same thing as having a value. And in scheme it is, in Lisp it isn't. We'll comment on that later. So a symbol in Lisp can have both a value definition and a function definition. And plus, by default, probably won't have a value definition. It only has a function definition. So plus is a symbol that I can use with its predefined function definition as the operator, first position in a list. I can't use it as a symbol unless I actually associate a value with it. So that would give an error. I can quote it, quote plus, and then that symbol goes into the list. All things for you to, to try out interactively. Um, last um, will give us the innermost list. 
not the last element, but rather the inner, innermost list. That's how it is defined. Um, if I want the last element, how would I do that? First of last, thank you. <laughs> and so a note on what cons cells and lisp lists are internally. We will eventually take advantage of this knowledge. So they're really chained pairs. A cons is a pair that combines a first and a rest, effectively two pointers. The first is an element in the list, the rest is another list. So the list one, two, three is represented as three such pairs, each of them a cons cell. And each has a first that points to an actual value, and each has a rest that points to a list, that is another cons cell. Or here, to terminate the recursive definition of the data type, the empty list. So all of the rests on the right-hand side are lists, including the empty list. All of the firsts on the other side are the actual elements in the list. So that means a flat list with n elements. How many const cells? n. I need one const cell so that its first pointer can point to the corresponding element. So for each element I need one const cell. Here we have a nested list where the first element of the list is actually a list itself. We can observe that here because the first pointer in the top level cons cell has as its value points to another cons cell. So lists are represent non-empty lists are represented as cons cells and the list containing one, two here, that is the first element of the list at large, is this substructure, this connected piece of two cons cells. Yes? Um, is there a strong convention? So it, you're observing that I can write the empty list as either nil, which is a symbol, or quote open paren, close paren, as we saw earlier. And both are valid. They both are the same thing, an empty list. Um, I couldn't say there is a strong convention. I personally use nil. And the Lisp interpreter, when it actually prints an empty list, it will print it as nil. So when the Lisp interpreter shows us an object, it needs to pick one representation. When there are multiple ways of printing it, it needs to pick one that is canonical. And I don't think that's actually standardized, but um, the Lisp interpreters I know <laughs> will print empty lists as nil. Um, okay, so that was briefly about the internal structures of lists. Now let's talk about assignment. So um, all of the things that do damage to the pure functional idea, let's get them out of the way. Um, most of the special forms you'll need, we learn today. Um, so um, assigning values just means um, associating a value with a symbol. And the canonical way of doing that at the top level to declare something that would function as a global variable is a special form called def parameter, parallel to defun, define function, define parameter. Takes two arguments, a symbol and a value. The value is actually evaluated, the symbol is not. It has a side effect. So it returns the symbol, but the side effect is that foo, or star foo star, now has as its value 42. What is it with the stars here? I said one symbol, so the star is just a, a, a regular character, like the bang or the plus. And star foo star is one identifier, so that's a convention. There's nothing special about the stars here. Um, it's a convention that many Lisp programmers and programs adopt to signify the names of global variables. We'll use them sparingly, and when we do, we put stars around them so that we know this is actually a global variable. Uh, just a convention. Uh, so def parameter essentially defines, introduces a global variable. There's a general special form to um, 
make value assignments. It's called setf, and it takes a place and a value. So in def parameter, the symbol is a place, and the value 42 is the value here. And place can either be a variable named by a symbol, as would be parallel with def parameter, or some other storage location where I can actually put a value. So here we can do, um, we can assign a new, we can change the value binding, the value associated with star foo star, by saying set f star foo star plus star foo star one. That's a special form, it has a side effect, it permanently changes the value associated with star foo star, so when I now evaluate it, it evaluates to its new value 43. It's destructive. Um, I can, we haven't talked about types so far, um, so I haven't really committed myself to what type of value star foo star can have. And hence, there's nothing standing in my way to say, actually, I want star foo star to have as its value a list. So that's what I make here. And I'm actually not confirming that star foo star now evaluates to the list containing 223, but I'm observing that I made a mistake here. I probably wanted the list containing 123. And now I can use setf to actually change the location that is the first element of that list. So here for the first time I use setf not with a symbol, but with what is called a generalized variable, an accessor. So first, given a list, will access the first pointer in that cons cell. And hence, setf, when used with a generalized variable like here, will put the value into that position. And if I now evaluate star foo star, the list is changed because I've changed destructively its first element. And um, I think that's all we need to know about setf at this point. So def parameter to define, introduce global variables, setf to make assignments either to global variables or other symbols or any other storage location where I can store values. Question. When I assign lists, do I have to know how big they are? No. Um, I don't. I don't declare a list to be of a static size. Um, in these examples, I usually just create them, so I just write them down. Or in the preceding examples, when I used list here, I create a list that contains as many elements as I give arguments to the list function. Nowhere do, you, do I need to say I want this list to be of length 3. Um, that's implicit. And it doesn't have a static length either. I can add to it, to the front or to the end, and increase it. Or I can take elements off and shorten it. So lists are dynamic in length. They use exactly as much storage as they need to represent their elements one cons cell for each element. That's the sort of benefits of this so-called singly linked representation of lists. That's what I as a student used to do when programming in C. <laughs> one had a, a little file that implemented singly linked lists. Um, and that was pretty much what is happening here. Um, all right, so that was set up, value assignment. Um, today is a bit of a, a mixed bag. We're throwing in all of the, a lot of the special forms, a lot of the um, things that go beyond the basic uh, rules of evaluation and uh, function invocation that I gave you in the beginning. Um, we want all of that out of our way. So here we have assigned a value to a generalized variable that in this case was the first element of a list. And you could, I guess, imagine that 
Um, there was a 2 here before that setf, and the setf has, as a side effect, changed this pointer here, so that it now points to the new value. The rest of the list, the rest of the nested cons cells, unchanged. No new memory used. Some more special forms, we'll sometimes say macro and special form synonymously, for assignment, um, and here I essentially tell you what type of thing they can operate on and how they are effectively implemented. So they're all shorthands for things I can I can say using just setup. And inc f increment by some step y, that which is optional and defaults to one decrement, same thing. So that takes one or two arguments, um, pushing and popping, that is using lists as a stack. We'll look at that a little more. And optionally a variant where I only push an element Y onto a list when it's not a member already. Um, I'm afraid we actually need to skip this part, um, the jointly trying to write push and pop jointly, but I'm thinking that could actually be a nice exercise for the laboratories next Monday. I think I'll also suggest that to, to Elena. And so these are more destructive special forms that um, are allowed to deviate from the standard rules of evaluation. And they all come down to assignment using setup. Um, Almost finally, um, we've talked about global variables, just symbols that are def parametered at the top level. But often we want to store intermediate results. We want something that um, is local to a specific context of computation within a function or otherwise. And the um, special forms in Lisp to create local variables, which are temporary value bindings for symbols are called let and let star. So again, I use the same syntax as expressions, prefix notation, parenthesized, um, fully parenthesized um, as expressions. Um, but the interpretation is that, so this is borrowed from what you often find in mathematical textbooks. Uh, let x be a vector of something. So here we say let star bar star be a local variable with value 7. And let bas be a local variable with value 1. And then in the body of this let, so this is the closing paren for the let, and I can evaluate an expression that uses bas, star bar, and star foo as arguments, as symbols, so they will evaluate according to their value binding. Star foo is a global variable. Um, what is star bar star here? That appears to be both a global variable and a local one. And now you might ask, which one should I use? We'll always use the local one. We'll use the one that is most, uh, that is closest to where we currently are. So. This evaluates to 50 because bas is 1, star bar star is 7, so that's 8, and foo is 42. So the value of star bar star that was used within this expression is the local temporary association, value association for it. Now if I evaluate the global variable star bar star, its value is unchanged. So the let has effect as long as I'm within the S expression. And as I leave that, it has no global effect. It has no side effect. What about BAS? When I evaluate that, it has no value because it only had a temporary value binding within the let expression. So that's just creating a block. And inside of that block, the let S expression, I can introduce, give myself as many names for local variables as I please, and 
they are the pairs that are the first argument, the list that is the first argument to the let. Um, so they are only valid in the body of the let, and previously existing bindos, bindings are shadowed. That's what we saw here. So when we eva evaluated this expression, we used the local value for star bar star, but after the let was evaluated, star bar star reverted, was unchanged um, to its global value. There's a variant of let, let star, that actually will do the introduction of these local bindings sequentially, let will actually do them pseudo-parallel, so that um, I can't refer to other local variables in the same let. Um, explained nicely in, in the Cybel book. Okay, um, final piece of terminology, essentially, that we need to throw in. Um, we'll often talk about predicates, and predicates are functions that test some condition. So conceptually they return a truth value, a boolean, where nil means false. So nil actually has a dual life in Lisp. It means boolean false and it means empty list. It's overloaded, we would say nowadays. And that's often convenient, um, sometimes confusing. <laughs> So those of you who have learned Scheme may be beginning to see how Scheme is a purified teaching dialect of Lisp. Scheme makes a clear, hard distinction between the empty list, quote, open paren, closing paren, and the um, Boolean false, hash f, and Scheme actually the standard does not include nil, the overloaded um, empty list, or false in Lisp. Furthermore, anything that is not false will be interpreted when we ask about truth values as true. And a special truth value is the symbol T um, that we can use to denote the, the Boolean true. And most of the predicates have in their name the suffix P. So list P takes one argument returns true when that thing is a list, otherwise returns nil. Um, null is a predicate, but lacks the p in its name. Um, so not all predicates um, have the p. Null was so established at the time that the standardization body felt will not rename it. Um, again, in scheme, what is it? I think it's null p, isn't it? No, null question mark, of course. So scheme, again, has purified that all of the predicates end in a question mark. Null tests its argument for being the empty list and the rest of 1, 2, 3 is the list containing 2, 3. That is not the empty list, so this predicate evaluates to nil, that is, is false. Even p, 2 is an even number. Even p of 3 would be nil. And I can form arbitrarily complex logical expressions using the standard Boolean connectives, not to negate a truth value and and or to create conjunction and disjunction. And so that's when we say write a predicate or the first argument to if is a predicate, then these are ordinary functions, but we look at their return value, we look at what they compute as a test something that we interpret as true or false. One thing we often need to test is equality. And as in other languages, um, that is actually a, a somewhat hairy notion. So there are several equality tests. And I'll throw them out um, here today, once and for all. But I expect you'll actually go back to the book every now and again and um, refresh uh, your understanding of how they differ. So um, here we'll talk about three different equality predicates, EQ, equal, equal, and equal P. And as the names get longer, the more complex the predicates actually get. And the basic distinction is between what is called identity, being one and the same object, 
versus equivalence. Two different objects that are equivalent, for some notion of equivalent, um, can test true for equivalence, but will not test true for identity. Only one and the same object will test true for identity. So EQ essentially compares two pointers. It asks are you guys, it takes two arguments, and it asks, are you at the very same location in memory? But it's not applicable for numbers or characters, and hence is so. It's what we often use with symbols. When we do symbolic comparison, then we're interested in, is this symbol the symbol of whatever, a pant, uh, some, some message? Um, so, symbols we'll typically compare using EQ. And EQ, EQL is an extension of EQ that is well defined for numbers and characters. So, when the things we want to compare for identity are numbers or characters, then we better use EQL. When we're unsure, we can err on the safe side and use EQL. EQ will be a tiny bit more efficient. So, where we know that we're really only comparing symbols or pointers, consults, um, not numbers or characters, then we might want to use EQ. Equal and equal P test the other notion of equality, equivalence. So they test structural equivalence, for example, for two lists or two strings. And two lists will test equal when they contain um, equal elements. So, a few examples. Um, two ways of writing down a list that contains one, two, and three. But these will be two different objects. I have two lists that contain the same three numbers, and hence they are not identical. But they are equal. They are equivalent. There is a structural isomorphism between them. I don't hear everything you say. <laughs> so y what happens when I compare a string that looks like the number 1, 2, 3, 4 to the actual number? 1, 2, 3, 4, a string containing four digits and an actual number. These cannot be one object, because they have different types. Will they be equal? No. Because this number doesn't have the sequential structure of the string. I mean, it looks the same when printed in decimal notation, but it's a numeric entity. It's not a, a string is a sequence of characters. A number is a numeric quantity. So. There is no predefined equality test that will say that these two are equivalent. They are in some sense equivalent. I mean, this string is the string representation of the decimal notation for this number, one, 1,234. But we would have, fortunately, I think, to write our own equivalence predicate to test for that. Um, let's walk through my remaining examples. So EQ on Two numbers, actually, the standard doesn't tell us. That depends on what the compiler does, whether it says there can be only one instance of the number 42, just like there can be only one sun, where we live, <laughs> and one moon, and or whether the compiler says, actually, I can have multiple objects that are the same number 42. Hence, the language, the standard, doesn't tie the compiler's hands here. But EQL on numbers, same number, we'll always test for identity using EQL. However, the numerically same number of different types, an integer and a floating point, are not identical. They cannot be the same object. But they are equal P. They are equivalent. Two strings. Um, so strings, I typically want to compare for equivalence, not identity. 
as I do here. And when they contain the same sequence of characters, they will be equivalent. Equal P generalizes that um, to a case insensitive comparison. I rarely use equal P in my own code. I mostly use EQ, EQL, equal. These are the three well-behaved critters in my view. In addition to these, there are type specialized equality tests. So the equal sign we have seen already in our factorial function. That is essentially EQL for numbers. So I can only use the equal, equal sign when I actually give it numbers. E the, the equal sign here with uh, two strings will throw an error. String equal uh, hardwires or ex well, declares, uh, makes the assumption that I will only give it strings as arguments. Yes? Um, I actually don't know, but I believe these are not equal. I mean, these are not equal sign, <laughs> but I actually don't know. <laughs> What's the answer? So, our 42, the integer, and 42.0, the float, do they compare true using the equal sign? Y All right, well, uh, that's a question to the Lisp standard, fortunately. <laughs> um, in the definition of this function, named by the equal sign, um, the standard needs to say what the compar comparison does across numbers of different type. Okay, and um, finally, to bring home something we've used already, conditional evaluation, when in my evaluation in the flow of my program, I actually want to create a branch depending on some predicate, on some condition. And we've used the if already, it takes exactly um, three arguments, a predicate, a test, and then has a then clause and an else clause. Now I'm out of battery. And so in this case, if foo actually is a number, it will evaluate the then clause, which is a string, which evaluates to itself, and the if will return that value. There's a generalization. Uh, Lisp tends to always have generalizations. That was part of the design principles from early on. So this is what is often called a switch or a case statement where I can have any number of predicates with associated branches that will be evaluated when the predicate returns true. So in this case, the return value would be more. Here are the general forms. If exactly one then and one else, which is actually optional, I could have only the then, can't any sequence of predicates, they are evaluated in order and associated clauses which will be evaluated and determine the return value for the first predicate that evaluates to true. All right, um, that was the thing, so symbols, now we can squeeze that in in one number, in one minute. Symbols can have values as functions and variables at the same time, I've said that already. So here I define a function foo, it takes a parameter x, and x is a, is a, is a value parameter. But I can, and, and this gives foo a function definition, but I can also define a global variable by the same name, and that will give foo a value definition. So the symbol foo now has both a function definition and a value definition, and depending on how I use it, when I put it as the first element inside a list, when I use it as an operator, Lisp will be looking for the function definition. When I evaluate it as a symbol, not in a function call, Lisp will look, look for the value definition. And with that, I think I wrap up. Um, and this comic, you can then um, read at your own leisure in the slide copies, which will go on the course page um, in the next 10 minutes. All right, thank you for today. Next laboratory this coming Monday. And a little bit of flexing our Lisp muscles then. For example, write our own push and pop, I think. We'll have some suggestions. And then most of the time this coming Monday, work on our current first exercise one. All right, see you next week.